Welcome to the Wild and Curious podcast, a show that's part travel, part feminism, and completely inspired by extraordinary women worldwide. I'm Teresa Christine. And I'm Suzanne Schmetting. Obviously, travel is mostly at a standstill right now. Yes. And lots of people, ourselves included, have had to cancel plans. Yes. But I do think that something that is positive about the pandemic is it's made people sort of stop and think, okay, well, like what is close to me and what can I, how, what can I explore that's around me? Oh yeah. I mean, like, I feel like the, the trips that I've gone on, you know, by myself or just in my car, just kind of taking a tour around California. Like I've always loved California, but I am very, very appreciative of how beautiful it is here. And I'm, you know, I feel so lucky to have a neighborhood to explore that's very close to me. And you also, you've been doing a little bit of work out of state, the good old Census Bureau. That's true. I counted people against you their will. People. Yeah. <laughs> was it was it against their will? <laughs> so much of the time it was against um, their will. You know, I'd be like, I just But it's I for just, their own damn good. It is for their own good. Like I wanted to throw broccoli at them too and just be like, eat that also. Yeah. And let me count you. But yeah. But you've gotten to explore some of Nevada that way. Like I saw some of your photos. You were going on hikes in the wilderness. Yeah. It yeah. looked beautiful. It was beautiful. Like I, there were a couple of times when I, I didn't get off work until nine or 10 at night, but I, you know, I would just stop my car in the middle of nowhere and, and do a little stargazing and, and scream. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, what do you do when you're alone? Like, <laughs> no, it's cool though, that you got to explore. Cause I've been to Vegas to do that like cliche Vegas trip. Oh, right, right. (laughs) To do the census. No, (laughs) to do the cliche Vegas trip. And I just, I've not explored it in the way that you have. So I think it's really cool that you had that opportunity. And I'm really excited about the person we've got on the show today because she's actually made a career out of talking about the place that she lives in. She, she is involved in travel. Yeah. But it's specifically to one place. And she lives there. Jessica Dante is the founder of Love and London, a digital media company that helps London tourists to visit like they live there. Life in London isn't as exciting as it usually is right now, to be honest. (laughs) Get off the show. <laughs> I I have to I have to report the 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 honest truth, I guess. Um well, <laughs> but normally life in London is fantastic. Um I mean, I I've just gotten so lucky that this city that I've chosen to be my new home a few years ago is just has so much to do in it and so much to explore. It's so diverse. Um, Oh my gosh, it's just great. And I really, I look forward to when it's kind of back to where it used to be. For the show, you're the first person we've had on the show who is actually not originally from the place that they live in now and that they're like so involved in the community. What made you fall in love with London? Well, I've always been a city lover. So I grew up in New York. I grew up on Long Island, which is not too far from New York City. And from the moment that I was able to take the train into Manhattan by myself or with some friends without my parents taking me, I just always loved the buzz of a city and the fact that there's just so much to do and you can't run out of things to to do unless you're actually not trying to like find new things to do (laughs) (laughs) and you're just not really making an effort so when I moved to London I kind of expected it was going to be somewhat similar to that but I wasn't that sure because I hadn't really been to London very much before I moved and when I did actually start diving into trying to discover interesting places to eat and things to do and places to take friends when they would come to visit. That was when I was like, okay, yeah. So London is very similar to New York in that aspect. Can you tell us what is the best and worst part about life in London? 
So I'm going to start with the worst, actually. So I think <laughs> <laughs> like Anyone who's living in a major city, um, probably around the world, the cost of living in London is obviously very expensive. Um, I'm currently on the hunt for trying to get my own place to live in um, without housemates or anything. And mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, and it's not cheap. It's it, I'm looking at places that are more affordable, but to be around where my friends are and um, not too far outside of the center of London is really difficult. Um, I mean, it's very expensive. And so that's that's a tricky thing. Um, that's probably really the only thing that I'm not super that I don't love about London and maybe also the fact that it is so widespread, the city, it can actually take quite a long time to get to different places. So depending on how, depending on where you live, and then if you're trying to go to visit a friend who lives on the other side of the city, and, and actually, they might actually not that be that far from where you live. But if you're not super connected where you are, or they aren't, and you have to take like a train, bus, tube to get there, a really short journey mile wise might actually end up taking like 45 minutes. And what about the best thing? Um, right. So I already said about how there's there's just so much to do. I mean, I have people that on my YouTube channel or, you know, on Instagram, they email me and, and they ask, is, is like six days in London enough? And I'm like, oh, my gosh, uh -huh. you, like I can't answer that question because people will live in London for their entire lives and they won't have discovered everything. And there's obviously always new things popping up and things going away and um, just always like new experiences to discover, new restaurants to try, new bars to try. I love that. Like it just keeps me busy and I feel like I'm never bored because it's just always, and that's part of my job too, is to like keep up with all this cool new stuff that's happening. Um, and I also love the, the diversity of the city. There, you know, London is just full of people who are not from the UK and so it makes me feel a little bit more at home because obviously I'm not from the UK, but it also means that we have all these pockets of communities where there's people, no matter where you're from, if you come to London, you'll be able to find a, a pocket of people that you can join up with and have like, you can talk about home. When you get homesick, you can stick together. Mm -hmm. You can go visit, you know, if you're from Sri Lanka, you can go to Sri Lankan restaurants and and. I mean, I think all the Sri Lankan restaurants are good in London. Maybe, maybe Sri Lankans <laughs> don't think so, but um, you can. It so it breeds this amazing, um, diverse population that also means that we have really you could you could find every cuisine in London, and there's just so much diversity. It's great. I mean, that's one of the things that I I love about city living too. Why did you start Love in London? I've always. Ever since I started traveling in, I guess, college, I would say, maybe when I studied abroad in college, um, I've always loved going someplace and then writing all of the recommendations down and then passing those recommendations on to other people that go to that place. That was like, it's like always was such a point of pride for me. So um, when I got into my working life out of college. And when I moved over here, I was working in travel and that was kind of feeding into that too. And, um, and then I've, I eventually wanted to branch out on my own and I knew I wanted to do something in travel that was like giving recommendations. And I had already started a blog called Love in London. And I had another website that was for study abroad students. And I essentially wanted to, I knew I wanted to eventually be doing something for myself where I was helping people with travel. I started realizing that I was actually watching a ton of YouTube and I wasn't reading blogs as much as I had been in the past because I was just loving like this video format. And I felt like I was really connecting with certain creators on YouTube and people who are in travel, people who weren't in travel. And so I thought, you know what, there's a lot of competition for written content on London, but there's not actually that much for video content. So let me try to produce some videos about traveling London. And this was like when I first started my channel, this was 20, I guess this was 2015. And um, oh, I went, we went back 
we went back on that channel. We we saw the old stuff too. Oh, <laughs> did you? Oh my goodness! Wow. Oh, um, no to no to the audience. Please don't do that. <laughs> no, it's but it it's really interesting because when I first started, I started making London videos, but I also was kind of like, oh, I don't really know if I want to pigeonhole into London. So I'm going to try some packing stuff um, and do like some general travel tips. And those videos didn't do very well, but the London videos did very well, almost from the beginning, um, even though I had no subscribers on the channel and I didn't really have any audience at all. But they they're, they were getting picked up in when people were searching on YouTube for like London guide and tips for London. So I was like, okay, well, obviously this is um, a gap in the market. There's not really any video content on London. So I kind of just, I was like, great, I live in London. So this is business model wise, this is great. Let me dive into this and give this a go for a year or so. And I produced every single week a video about something about traveling to London. And um, it just grew, continued to grow. And I continued to try to make the videos better. And I started an email list. And um, I was freelancing at the time. So I'd do like a month of love in London stuff and like cram it all into a month. And then I'd go on a contract doing some social media work at an agency for a month. And then I would go back to love in London. And, and eventually, I was able to build up love in London to a big enough audience and generating generating enough revenue where I could just do it full time. Yeah, it's so wild. Because when you think of like, someone who's a YouTuber, I think of someone who's Gen Z, like super like teenager, 15 years old, like, look at my skate tricks, you know, and there there's just this whole like, market of really well done videos like yours, that are super helpful. And like, you know, just made from really great people. So it was it's I've been following you for a while. So it's great to get to chat with you. The other thing that's interesting about your perspective is that you are you are not from London, you are an American. How do you feel that that kind of gives you a unique angle that resonates with tourists? I think because I can relate to being on the outside more. And I think I just, I can understand, especially when I speak, you know, the majority of my audience are American. So I can kind of understand where what Americans need when they're traveling. Yeah, I think it kind of just stems from like, I have lived in London for over seven years now. But at the end of the day, I'm still like, kind of a newbie. And I've, mm -hmm. and I think the advantage, especially when I was first starting was, I was so I'm not jaded by London, whereas even you know, my friends that are English and grew up outside of London, just like on the outskirts in the home counties there, London's not really that big of a deal to them, I guess. So they try to, they're not as like inquisitive, I think, as I am. So I so quickly moved over here. And then for my English friends became the go to person for asking for recommendations from like my my friends that had lived outside of London their entire lives were asking me <laughs> who had lived here for two years for recommendations like all the time. And I do think I think it's just that like constant inquisitive inquisitiveness of this is still, you know, there's still so much of London to explore. And I, I like I'll never be able to like get all of it. And I think that's I think only somebody who wasn't who hasn't grown up in London or out or just outside of London. I don't think you, I think it's hard to have that. Yeah, it's like that, that appreciation as I don't want to say an outsider. I mean, you've lived there for quite a while now. But like you said, staying curious about things and you're asking, well, like, why is this thing this way? Or like, what is this thing that I can possibly do? You're always looking for something. So that's really cool. Uh, something else that I know, like, now is an especially weird time. Not many people are traveling to London. Not many people are traveling at all. But something that you had mentioned that you're trying to be a little bit more conscious of is the recommendations that you make and, you know, really highlighting diverse business owners in London. And I guess, like, what are some great Black-owned or BIPOC-owned businesses in London for people to check out that maybe they can't visit now, but they could, like, order something online or or places that they can go in the future? 
Yeah. So yeah, it's something that I think um, I had been conscious of in my recommendations. And, and I guess, I guess, I don't know if bias is the right word, but as, as a, you know, middle-class white woman, it had come to my attention, I would even say last year that I talk, you know, I was talking a lot about, and I still obviously talk about how I love how diverse London is, but I wasn't really reflecting that diversity as much as I think I probably should have been in the recommendations I was giving. Um, and I think actually that happens, and this is not an excuse or anything, but I think that's pretty common in just London travel media in general. So my first recommendation would be to take a Black History Walks tour. They do a bunch of different tours around London, around different areas, and around different topics concerning Black history in the UK. I did one of their Notting Hill tours recently, and honestly, it was eye-opening because when we think of Notting Hill, at this point, we're now just thinking about cute cafes and pretty streets and the colorful houses, but actually... This area is really important in the history of Black culture in London, and I learned so much about this area when I went on this tour. I'd also recommend, of course, heading to Brixton, which has a significant Afro-Caribbean population, and again, is another area that's a huge part of the story of Black culture in London. When you're in Brixton, I would recommend going to the Black Cultural Archives. It's the only national heritage center with archived items that celebrate the histories of African and Caribbean people in Britain. They have things there that's documenting like Black music, the Windrush era, Rastafari, and other subjects. In terms of restaurants, um, I love Ikoi and Mayfair. It was started by two friends, uh, one of them, Ure, he's Nigerian-born, and the dishes at Okoye are West African-inspired. They use a lot of like amazing ins- spices and a lot of ingredients specifically from Nigeria, which means that like the dishes are really interesting and unique, at least for me. It's also Michelin-starred, which is especially impressive and quite interesting because it's really... I've read the only starred restaurant in the world that's championing indigenous African ingredients. Okay, I I do have two more. um, And these two were brought to my attention by Ashley Moyo. She's written some amazing pieces for our website that shared some great black owned businesses that you can visit while you're in London. Um, So she turned me on to Dark Sugar's Chocolate Shop in Shoreditch. And actually, oh my God, This place, you can smell it from down the road because you can smell like the cocoa and the chocolate just emanating from the shop. It's so nice. And the founder, Nyanga, she actually learned about cocoa and chocolate on her family's cocoa farm in Ghana. And then she came back to London to open up her chocolate shop and she uses all Ghanaian cocoa beans. And then back in Brixton, there's this bookshop called Roundtable Books where they sell inclusive children's books because apparently only 1% of children's books have a non-white character in them. So the founders of the shop wanted to help share the books that are in that 1%, especially for such a diverse area. So that's a really good little shop that you could visit while you're in London. And of course, there are tons of other businesses and pieces of Black history that are all around London, um, but I think that should be good to start everybody off. So do you have any exciting plans for right now or, or I mean, obviously the future? Like, what, what are you working on now? We don't really know when travel is going to pick up. And the thing about the majority of my audience being from America is obviously a lot of Americans rightfully so, I totally understand this, might feel um, worried to travel internationally, even as a vaccine comes out or um, as the quarantine restrictions lift. So I'm just kind of going through and trying to think of some ideas for when things do start to pick up again. I really want to create some travel guides that are um, focused on specific areas and uh, some very like unique things to do in those areas. So I'd like to publish those next year. Um, we had planned this year that we were going to start launching experiences in London that you could book. Um, so that's for sure something that I want to explore. And that's also where I would like to um, 
offer some experiences that are focused on history that is um, for my minority history, I would say, and um, focusing on businesses that are not just white owned. And yeah, I'm also currently working on producing a video course for Bright Trip called um, How to Travel Sustainably. So that's going to be about travel in general. Oh, that's exciting. so exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that would be my third course that I've produced for them. Uh, the other two are about London. And um, yeah, so and that's another, that's something that I'm really quite pas passionate about is how can we make sure that we're traveling in a way that's not disrupting the locals and that isn't harming the environment. And we're making sure that our tourist dollars are going to the right people and not to big irresponsible corporations. So I'm very excited about that. Like the difference between people who've lived in a place for a long time versus people who move there and, and the different types of love they feel. I think it's really interesting because like, I'm not from Los Angeles or, or more specific, like I'm not from California. So even, oh my God, you are I, from <laughs> I know I'm from California. What's That's, in your coffee? Uh, more coffee. Um, <laughs> what I meant to say is like, I'm from California and I love it here. I, you know, I'll, I'll tell people all about California all day long, but I also kind of take it for granted, you know, because it's just like, oh yeah, like I'm, I'm from here. Like I take for granted all of the sunshine and, and the beaches that are nearby. And you also, I think you also kind of fall into the things that you know and love a little yeah. bit easier when you're from there. Yeah, exactly. You know, so it's just, it's, it's a little bit harder for me to, to go outside of the things that I've known all my life. Whereas someone who just moves to California is like, let's do this, let's do this. You know, I, I had a friend visit from, from out of the country and, and he was just like, let's go to the beach. And I was like, ah, oh, the beach, it's, it takes 35 minutes to get there. There's traffic. And it's just sandy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I love the beach personally. I know you don't, but but he was just like, you know, 35 minutes? Are you kidding me? Like, let's go. I was like, oh, fine. And what Jess was talking about of having this curiosity and like constantly asking questions, it's such such a beautiful thing. And she is such a great resource for London in that regard. Yeah. Because yeah, she. I mean, she has the outsider's perspective, but then she also has like the perspective of what it's like to live there. It's sort of this perfect mesh of those combined. Yeah. No, I, I cannot wait to go and have her tell me to ignore platform nine and three quarters. You can follow Jess Dante and get all the London tips at youtube.com slash love in London, or you can go to her website, loveinlondon.com. You can also find her on Instagram at, you guessed it, at love in London. If you enjoy listening to the Wild and Curious podcast and would like to contribute to helping us make this thing run, you can. You can Venmo us at The Wild and Curious or via PayPal at paypal.me slash The Wild and Curious. Anything you send, big or small, will go towards the costs of running a podcast that's dismantling the patriarchy. It means so much to us when people rate our show on iTunes and leave reviews. We read those sweet nothings, and yes, we cry about them. We also love it when people send our podcast to someone who they think will enjoy it. Feminists sharing feminist content is the best.